Thank you, Kevin. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is the conversation we've all been waiting for. If you're involved in the sector in any way, everybody is extremely anxious about how do we get uh, back into work. I'd like to say a special thank you to Kevin Jones from Sakia for helping us with the administration of this. Um, he also comes with some very helpful and important resources, in fact, uh, giving us five handouts uh, as, as an important reference and a guide for our conversation today. Also, he will be running some important surveys because it's as important to us, not just to engage with our panelists, but also to engage with you. We'd like to know how you're involved in, in the sector, uh, what your concerns are. And while we've, um, we are still getting in a lot of our attendees, and while I'm just doing a quick introduction to our panel, I just want to establish what it is we are trying to achieve today. Um, I think the simplest way to put it is that everybody is anxious about what are we going to confront when we go back to work. We are making up the rules because if we don't do it, who's gonna? And we are trying the best we can with what we have. And I think as a sector, we've done a really amazing job. So let's try and, and explain, um, guide each other and our audience through um, what, what are we going to, to have at our disposal? What are the resources? Um, what are the protocols? And let's see if we can make those work and if we can help to answer a lot of the questions that we have already posed to us. I can say up front, we are not going to have all the answers and that's okay. We just need to do the best we can and try and guide each other through it. So, um, Tinas, briefly, uh, where, where, where are you from? So, I'm from Sakia. I serve on both the board and uh, Sakia's big council, which is the Broadcast Industry Group. So, uh, I represent uh, the Broadcast Industry uh, from a Sakia perspective, that is. Thank you, Tinas. Anna, please, your turn. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Anna Duckworth formerly known as Anna Salile, um, and I'm representing the Personal Managers Association, um, the PMA, and that is a board, uh, an association of agents that try and uphold the standard of our industry, um, the Personal Managers Association. Thank you. And Ian? I'm uh, Ian Free from the Public Safety Company. We're an occupational health and safety company, and we supply... Uh, medical services as well as cleaning services uh, and we've got a small security wing in our business too thank you we've got daphne daphne your microphone's muted do you want to try it again daphne is there a setting there that we can help with kevin um you do an excellent mime job, though, Daphne, I have to say. OK, I've, I've just launched a, a poll that we can run while we're waiting for Daphne to come back. And um, and I'll see if I can solve uh, Daphne's problem. Thank you. It's not going to work. So there you go. I've just closed that poll, and okay. uh, and I'm going to move on. Daphne, uh, have you figured out how to get your uh, microphone? No. Uh, who else is here on the panel that we can move on to? We've got Melina. Melina, you're still here with us. I'm here. I still haven't figured out my camera. For some reason, it doesn't want to work, but I'm here. All right. I as represent long as you're the there. CPA, the Commercial Producers Association. Thank you very much. Um, a quick question, whether we have Roberta anywhere around. Roberta, you're here. I am here. Uh, can you not see me? We can't see you, Roberta, but as long as I can hear you, I'd much rather get started now. How does that suit everyone? Uh, but let's try. Yeah, we'll try in the meantime to get seen. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Um, 
Uh, is that your your second poll there, Kevin? Yes, it is. Absolutely. I, I think I'll just pop them up whilst, whilst we're talking so that we can gather some information and then we'll talk about them afterward. Yeah, awesome. that's fine. Let's get started, everybody. Um, to kick things off, just a reminder, um, we have some resources available to us and a lot of safety protocols have already been introduced into the industry. They are being shared and Kevin has generously put them up as our handouts as well. Um, going into studio again is I think going to be relying on whatever information is published. Uh, it's going to be an important resource for, for all of us. Um, if you don't mind, um, Ian, maybe you can just start things off for us. Is there ever a right time for us to go back? Um, it, it, it may not be ideal, but I don't see how the industry can suspend itself any further. We've got to try and get back uh, with whatever we have at our disposal. Um, shall we just jump into it? And, and do you think we can rely on the protocols that we've developed so far? The, the right time is probably the biggest question at the moment um, because because we, we can't be sure what we're dealing with at the moment uh, in terms of the, the virus itself. It's an unprecedented situation. It's a new virus. We're working on four months or, or the scientists are working on four months sort of worth of, uh, of information and trying to find a way for us to go back and be safe. The going back is, is inevitable. Uh, but it's also necessary. We can't sustain forever just being in a lockdown phase. And I know there's a lot of opinion around that, but we do need to find a way to go back. We need to find a way to go back safely. And we need to try and identify the safest ways to do that. I think that the system in place at the moment um, is most, in, we, we're not all the way there and we never will be. But we've been lucky the way that it's played out. We've had uh, decent guidance from government. The, we've had we've seen good consultation within the industry, and I think that the working documents that are that are in front of all of us are a good starting point for us to develop protocols to work safely on our different productions. Okay, we've got nearly 400 people who've uh, logged on, and I'm sure most of them are anxious to know what is work going to look like when we get back in. Could I ask uh, Roberta, if you don't mind, if um, uh, based on all the, the, the submissions that have been made and the protocols that have been drafted, uh, give us a sense of what's going to be different. Um, if the last time you were in, in, in the studio uh, was a month and a half ago, what's going to be different as you walk into work uh, this week? Well, I think uh, when we left off a month and a half ago, remember that um, people, quite a number of productions shot until the lockdown. Some ended a little bit before the lockdown so that people could get home. And some of those protocols had already been introduced in terms of hand sanitizers, uh, cleaning, um, um, social distancing, um, you know, some of it, some of it had been put in place, and the washing of hands and all of the rest of it that we all know about. But what has happened in the meantime is that there's been a scrutiny um, with a lot of input from the industry as to, you know, how can we best protect um, those that are coming back to work. And so, yes, it's going to be, you know, a lot stricter from. You know, arriving at set, um, going through a screening process, having to give information um, about your, you know, your health condition, um, where you've been, who you've been in contact with. Um, so, if there was an eventual case, um, you know, all the uh, tracing data is there. Um, so, in our instance, and I'm sure that you know all productions are following this, you, you would arrive go through security um, and then immediately, you know, move towards the medic um, and have with the compliance officer and have these questions asked and do your daily screenings, which is, uh, you know, taking your temperature. Um, I think it's if people can take their temperature in the morning before they come to work, because if your temperature is going to be over 37 and a half 
you're going to go into an isolation room. And then a whole set of these people. I'm not sure what that is, but anyhow, a whole set of procedures take place where, um, you know, you've got to contact the uh, uh, COVID center, um, um, control center in terms of disease in your area. And they question the person who's now got the temperature to assess whether they should go for COVID testing or whether they should just go and see their medical uh, practitioner. Uh, and then you would be transported to your, um, you know, your wherever you need to go. If it is suspected to be COVID, um, then, you know, immediately they start seeing who had contact with that person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there might even be a, a sort of semi shutdown of the set. So um, that's the first thing. Then, um, you know, you are going to wear a mask at all times and some crew will be wearing a visor um, and and uh, the actors will be issued with a mask and, an, and, and a visor. And of course, once they've put their makeup on, they won't necessarily be wearing, um, you know, the mask, they'll be wearing the visor. Um, so it's a very, it's a very, very different environment. And, um, I think that it's going to be, it's going to carry its stresses. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go through all the detail of the protocols because they have been um, circulated um, and should have been circulated far and wide. But uh, one thing is for sure, there is a responsibility on everybody to implement these protocols. And, you know, production companies can put it in motion. But in the end of the day, it's going to be up to every single person on that set to be extraordinarily vigilant about their own safety and the safety of those, uh, you know, next door to them, um, and really abide by the by the protocols um, because yeah. it's and it's and it's not a risk-free environment that we're moving into. Absolutely, uh, I think that's that's such an important point. Um, I want to ask Tinnis about that actually, uh, Tinnis. I think you, you've had exposure in your 30 something year career to be involved with a number of different industries and how they, they work. Our industry is, is fascinating in that it relates with so many different sectors. So uh, even though that, that's part of the joy of, of what, what we experience when we work within our sector, it also presents its own risks. So we, we interrelate with so many different service providers uh, technical crew, performers, uh, admin, support staff, production team, everybody is interrelating. Doesn't this present in itself a challenge on its own and its own risks as well as far as the infection goes? No doubt. Uh, um, absolutely. Uh, I think our industry is quite unique in the sense that we've got many different sectors, each of which sort of speak their own language uh, in a manner of speaking. So sound engineers, cameramen, production people, uh, you stand around with actors, you will find they've got a particular way of speaking, technical people. Yet if you put all of them in the same room, they converse and they get along as well. And they, they speak a different language, sort of a global uh, industry language, if you will. Um, I think the challenge comes in, in that each of these departments have unique uh, challenges uh, set before them. Um, I've read through all the uh, proposals and stuff that's put out, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is, for instance, on the sound side, there's very few guidance. So on the sound side, I think the, the soundies need to get together and talk a little bit more about the challenge that we face in particular, because production people won't necessarily know what it is that sound people have as a particular uh, issue. Um, the more noticeable stuff is the is the frontline stuff, the tip of the spear stuff, the um, actors, makeup, um, everything that happens in front of the camera. But behind the scenes, there's a lot more. So the moment you get inside the control room, you find that if you have a director, uh, vision mixer, vision control, uh, graphics, all these people, if you've seen what a control room look, looks like, how are you going to manage a two meter <laughs> space between individuals? Uh, so we may have to think creatively and out of the box to some extent to, to manage some of those challenges uh, in a similar way as we've gotten to a place where we say 
uh, once an actor needs to act, he's got to get rid of the mask and 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 and, and the uh, uh, the shield. Uh, that just won't work. So we'll have to come up with similar sort of things behind the scenes. Unfortunately, these things will only show themselves uh, once we put these uh, guidelines into practice, um, exercise them, see how they work, and then come up with variations on that or proposals as how to mm. possibly modify. I, I think, um, yeah, you've, you've segmented the, the value chain quite neatly there and each one will have to face their own challenges. I'd like to talk about the, the tip of that spear um, when I ask Anna what her thoughts are. Uh, but first, thoughts just quickly are, to go to first, Kevin, there, are, there are questions about how many, there, how many there different how many subsectors are allowed to return under this um, under the new regulations. I, I understand photographers are concerned about whether they can go back uh, independent filmmakers, certainly those who work in studio, yes. But what what are the the other uh, disciplines involved that have been wondering under the new regulations whether they are permitted to return to work? Do you have any answers for them, Kim? Well, I, you know, I've spoken to many people, so the issue I think is that uh, there's been a, a discussion about, uh, and, and the minister addressed this when he spoke uh, on um, was it Sunday or Monday? It was Monday. Under, he spoke about people working in the value chain of broadcast, and, and that's why I, I put up you know, one of the slides that I put up earlier was where do you play in the, in the value chain? Uh, so that this was uh, this was the, the results of that particular question. Uh, so 46% in pre-production, 30% in concept development, but 80%. So there were multiple answers to this question. 80% of people involved in um, in production, in the production environment. And so then the question is, where do you sit in that production environment? And as Tina said, there are lots of stakeholders. So people in professional audio, uh, profession, people in, in animation and graphics and, and all sorts of other things. Um, but, but certainly as things stand at the moment, I think the broad industry opened up. There are a couple of uh, strange kind of situations. So people in the pro audio industry have been saying, well, I do most of my work in the corporate space. I don't really work in broadcast, but I do a bit of work in broadcast. Can I go back to work? And my assertion here is people should just be sensible. Uh, you know, if you're doing a, if you're doing some broadcast work and you're back in the office, there's no reason why you couldn't do some corporate work. But let's understand your clients are probably not back at work. Mm. So. Um, uh, so I think that's the biggest challenge. And of course, we still need to be in a situation where if you are going to work, uh, you need that SIPSI release form and you need uh, some kind of documentation from from the employer as well, uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to travel. Um, so there are some practical issues, but I think the sensible thing to do is just you know, be aware of, of where you stand in the in the broadcast value chain and engage respectfully with your colleagues and if you do that i think you'll be quite safe yeah and i think if we if we have any further questions about this um of, i think kevin is is a good hub for that information to be shared Anna, let's come to you i think you're dealing a lot with the with actors through your agency and working with other agents as well uh the the part of the sector that tina's called the the tip of the spear um, what are your performers most concerned with? What are, what, what are some of the questions you're getting? How are you advising them? And are you directing them to the safety protocol that's already been put out by the industry? Thank you, Jack. Um, yes, yeah, so absolutely, as you had mentioned previously, there is a lot of anxiety and uncertainty at the moment. And of course, with, um, with actors who are already generally uh, in, a, in a space where they are uncertain um, about their careers and about, you know, work. <laughs> this is a very difficult time and um, I think my, the most questions we've been dealing with is just how each production is going to deal with or sort of um, the protocols that are going to be put into place um, on set and, you know, with castings as well. And I think each, just as Roberta said, we've received quite a bit of documentation. We've received the protocols. So we can't go through each of them, but we do send those out to all of our actors. And my biggest um, 
bit of advice to actors, my actors, all actors, everyone that is going back onto set and back to work, is that they should be completely aware. They should be vigilant. They should be aware of what the protocols are, what each production is aiming to do, and of course, what their responsibilities are on the set as well, um, in terms of personal hygiene, personal, you know, just in, ensuring that they themselves are taking care of themselves and are following the protocols that are set out. So I do think that whilst there is anxiety and whilst there is panic, as everyone has mentioned, we can only but um, figure it out as we go along. And I think that each, each, it's each person's responsibility to sort of um, ensure that they are, they are aware and that they are equipped with all of the protocols that will be set in place. Zafi, um, have we got your, your audio back on? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so, talking on uh, as, as a crew agent, I think, you know, uh, the crew is basically the, the lifeblood, the, the spirit of the production, keeping everything going, offering some kind of structure. They are, in many respects, the um, the, the, the discipline that executes the entire thing, that keeps the day running. Um, there, there will be challenges, though, because they're the ones who will be ha handling equipment constantly. Um, they're going to have to be sanitizing that equipment constantly. Um, what are some of their concerns? Do, do they feel as if they, are, um, they have the, uh, the consumables, the sanitizers, do they have all everything that they need at their disposal in order to get through the day, given that a lot of their time now is going to be spent sanitizing, cleaning, and just keeping stuff stowed away like that? Well, I think um, we do, as, a, as a, a crew base, a lot of our crew, especially the technical guys, are already wearing gloves. I think that, you know, they, they are quite used to working in that regard. I think the masks and the those kind of things are going to definitely um, pose their own problems, especially around mm. around camera and and I think limiting number of people around camera would be, you know, in our opinion, a, the, the better way to go. Allowing them to have remote focus units, allowing people not to have to be on top of each other. Um, I do think that, um, you know, productions are going to have to allow for in their budgets to have all that protective gear and all that sanitizing stuff close at hand. I think the ADs have got a very big job at hand to try to put these new schedules together, allowing for everyone to have time to clean and to sanitize their gear and as well as themselves and the locations, um, you know, when we're in those situations. But I think it, you know, we're resourceful people and crew in general, I think, you know, we, we just cut from a different kind of cloth where we just figure it out. Um, you know, we take whatever challenges are thrown at us and we find the best solution for it. So I think as an industry to pioneer moving forward, I think we're, we're quite lucky to have the brains that we, you know, use every day to pioneer the way forward, maybe not necessarily just for our own industry, but for other industries, um, you know, to take our protocols and, and use and learn from them. I think the first couple of weeks but going back to shoots are going to be very, very exciting and very challenging. And I think communication is going to be key. I think, you know, if, if you see something isn't working, speak to the line producer, speak to the PM, speak to the AD, just, you know, and I think that there definitely needs to be a sense that you're not going to get penalized, you're not going to get like shut down, you know, we're all working together to find a way forward. And I think that's the only real way to, to move forward where we are now. I think, yeah, absolutely. The stakes are really high and you, you, you're so spot on. I think we are going to be relying on the most enterprising and pioneering part of the entire value chain right there. Um, Let's ask Melina to come in here. Melina, I have questions uh, about lunchtime because lunch is always on the top of my agenda. Um, <laughs> how do you intend uh, controlling that given that there's, um, if, if there's one part of the day where uh, safety protocols are likely to be relaxed to some extent, um, how will we manage that? How will the CPA manage that? Uh, commercial producers uh, are working off their own protocol as well. Um, what's the plan around lunchtime, Alina? When we were writing the protocol, we actually spent quite a lot of time focusing on catering because it feels like a really hot subject. 
and we did also look at all the different options of what everyone is doing internationally. We are suggesting that there is no craft table, that everyone gets individually packed meals. We actually are discouraging any sharing of utensils in any way. And in all of this, it's also very critical that everything is eco-friendly. Um, departments called uh, department lunch times will be staggered so that not everyone is sitting at the same time um, because it really feels very counterproductive to have one big open lunch area and not uh, be aware of the distance between people. So that's a very critical thing. So those are the hotspots that we kind of uh, latched onto. Every single person will have their own individual water bottles to fill up. Um, we're trying to find, we're trying to source at the moment water dispensers that are not physically touchable mm. because we also don't want to go back to entering the world of plastics so um, and filling the filling everywhere with a million plastic water bottles if it can be avoided. Um, so yeah, those okay. are the things we've taken into account in a nutshell. In our protocols, we have actually specified quite a lot around catering because that's a very hot subject, I think. Yeah, and you're quite right, it should be. I just want to, while I'm still with you, just to ask you your approach to the um, the management of background actors. And as you're responding to that, I'm going to ask Roberta to respond after you on the same theme. Um, what's your, um, to Melina, just uh, what's, what's the approach then dealing with background actors? So by background extra actors, are you meaning extras? Yes. Yes. So we would like to encourage background extras to not um, to not be wardrobe, to come in wardrobe if possible. Um, they need to be kept separate from the rest of the license. Sorry. Sorry, it was me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, they need to be separated from the. They have to have a separate holding area and a, um, a separate a separate from the rest of the talent. Um, similarly, we do not want to. We want to avoid, if possible. I mean, it is so subjective to the scene, so um, big disclaimers. But we would like as much as possible to avoid makeup for any of those people or hair. People should come prepped or be cast prepped so as to avoid cross contamination. Also, every single person on set has to wear a mask until such time as they get onto. Um, onto the performance uh, and onto the stage where they need to be, whether it be on location or whether it be in thing. And also obviously with, with lead actors, once makeup is done, we can't put a mask over them. So we have provided shields for that purpose. Okay. Um, Roberta, on the same theme of um, background actors? Um, well, um, I agree with everything that's been said, except that you know, we intend to keep um, extras down to an absolute minimum. Um, mm. Also to, you know, do a lot of uh, questioning beforehand on the group of extras that you're bringing in. So, you know, questions like, do you live with someone who's been, uh, you know, part of an essential service? Um, you know, the usual questions so that you can also uh, minimize risk there. Um, I'm very pleased that um, in the end, the final protocol was that if people cannot drive themselves to work, that you do provide transport, um, because I think that that does, you know, does minimize the risk. But um, yeah, it, it, it's a question of, of absolutely controlling it and keeping background extras down to an absolute minimum. And, and, and in our situation, you know, in, in all those productions where telenovelas or soaps are being produced, to try and work, you know, identify a core a group of extras, um, which you then work with, because then it's almost like a part, you know, actors in a way that, you know, you, you're not getting a different person every day, that you, you sort of say, okay, this is our group that we're working with. So I think I think undoubtedly there are definitely you know going to be some compromises on the screen. I think it's inevitable. 
um, you know, scenes have had to be adjusted, scenes have had to have people cut down in in the scenes. Um, you know, certain certain changes have had to be made. Um, you know, and I mean, if you think of all the love scenes you've got, etc., where you know there's going to be no um, facial uh, uh, contact um, at all at this point in time. Um, you know, yeah, there's a certain amount of adjustment to scripts that's also you know been necessary to to control the environment. I think um, Roberta knows me too well top of my agenda is lunch followed by love scenes um but i think you you picked up on a very important point there uh, roberta i'd like to to just ask the arrangements for transport could you take us through that please because i see there are a number of questions relating to um the obligations that lie with producers to provide transport what is the the regulation there well, the final regulation was that people, um, you know, if they don't have their own transport and they can't get themselves to work, they need to be transported. And in a normal sedan, you won't put more than three people. And in a combi um, or, or um, you know, yeah, a bigger bus or even a, an Avanza, um, you would then have uh, abide by the rules of the taxi association where it would have to be 70% full. Um, and obviously, the vehicles have to be, uh, you know, sanitized beforehand and, uh, you know, constantly, um, you know, cleaned throughout the day. The other thing that we've actually uh, encouraged is that everybody actually is issued with their own sanitizer bottle because I feel, you know, Take an example of an actor who now, you know, has to pick up a prop. Now, I think that the actor in this instance has the total right to offer a pair of gloves, pick up the object, spray it with their own sanitizer, and be satisfied that this prop is something they want to pick up. Um, you know, we've also uh, taken the stance in terms of standby that you have standby on set, but wherever possible, the uh, actor sorts out their own shiny forehead or a hair that needs to be put in a different place. Um, and we will have mirrors, you know, a mirror on set where they can go up to the mirror, they can do it for themselves as far as possible. So we're going to be, I think we all need to be very cognizant um, of the performer here because, you know, a, a, a performer has to kind of, forget about this environment that's happening around them and actually act, you know, um, and, you know while you're wearing that's, your vibe, I'm like you that's have to cool. <laughs> and you have to act. So I yeah. think that, that you know, it, it, it is going to be a discipline and, and how to get there. And I'm sure, as, uh, as Daphne has said, things will settle down, be resourceful people. And, and one thing I would like to say, you know, this is definitely not the time for anyone to be throwing their toys, uh, stalking off set, um, blah, blah, blah. It's not the time. We're all together in this against this bug. And we need to help one another. We need to assist one another. And during this process, I feel that we all need to be incredibly kind and incredibly considerate to one another and one another's function. Because also, you know, crews have been reduced. So you have the added pressure of people, um, you know, doing more uh, in more departments because we've had to reduce numbers to abide by the maximum number of people. So yeah. you know, I, we have to help each other through this. I, I, that's, I think that's such a helpful and useful reminder, Roberta, because we all need to remember that um, if government wanted us as a sector to return to work on level two or one, that's what would happen. So we are actually all trying very hard to make this work and we'll do whatever it takes. Um, I was um, in, in the discussion about transport and background actors, I think I saw Ian's beard growing a little gray. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to check in with Ian about um, managing risk in those areas. And if you could reflect quickly on those two points uh, in particular, uh, background actors as a risk, uh, transport as a risk, and any other areas that you might think of that could present a risk as we go back in. 
Well, I think the three biggest ones are catering, transport, and extras. So, um, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's a reason they came to mind first for everyone. Um, on the on the extras at the moment, we're actually advising no extras. Um, you know, if, if you've got sort of far distance scenes, try and try and get some uh, some crew, uh, you know, corral crew into helping you out. Um, but for now, it's it's a, such a moving target. We need this first period to work out where we are, to work out what works in the protocols, what you know in the guidelines, what doesn't work in the guidelines. And the last thing we need is um, is wild cards. And, and unfortunately, just by the nature of, of their calls, you know, an extra becomes a wild card from a risk perspective. Uh, the safety, a large part of the safety factor at the moment is that we're working in these little pockets. So working towards 50 people, we've got 50 known entities. Uh, you know, we can do good background checks on them. We check in them every day, we can start to see trends. And so that that becomes a risk management, an element of risk management. Uh, so our advice at the moment to 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 the production houses we're working with is uh, no extras in the in the short short term. Uh, the next phase will be the move to a small pool of extras you can sort of use all the time, uh, and then we'll evaluate as we go from there. Uh, on the transport thing, absolutely, public transport uh, again major wild card. So I was really chuffed with that, that in, in, to see that in, in all of the paperwork, uh, the suggestion that everyone be provided transport. And certainly on our side, the productions we're on at the moment, the transport thing has been addressed. Um, even if it comes down to, to sort of ride sharing, giving each other lifts, uh, a lot of corporate transport, you know, or company transport being put on. Uh, and that, that changes it from our perspective. It's, it's one more thing we don't need to stress about. It's actually a question that we've added to our script though. So when you come in in the morning and you get your temperature scan, one of the questions you're asked is, how did you get here today? Because we want to know and we want to be able to monitor it because that's going to be important in the trend if anything were to go wrong. Yeah, I think that uh, the questionnaire is going to be a big, um, uh, a big part of it. There's going to be something new. I'd like to, to couple that with the compliance officer role which um, is mooted now for the first time in this protocol um, i'd like to explore that idea of the compliance officer ian could you kick us off then on um, what is the role of the compliance officer what makes them different as an added element uh, now that we're trying to manage the um, the risk of infection and what are some of the questions we are going to be asking in that uh, health questionnaire as people come in so the the, comp, the role of the compliance officer was first put down in, I think it was the disaster management amendment that came out. Um, as you all know, there's so much paperwork at the moment. Uh, but the role of the compliance officer is um, to put together what is called in the document a workplace action plan. It's the addendum E, if anyone looks for it in the, the disaster management release. Um, and in that plan, to ensure that a COVID-specific risk assessment is done, that the plans and procedures of the, of the, the act are put together, uh, or at least are followed, and then as well as to measure adherence is the word that's in the act. I'm looking at it at the moment. So in our industry, a compliance officer um, has a hell of a task. We, we did a really interesting exercise. Um, it came up earlier, Tinnis was saying about how, you know, each department's going to have its challenges. We did a really interesting exercise last week where we sat down and had um, small meetings with, with each department on a production and then duplicated or replicated that on a number of, of productions. And we uh, built a risk assessment off of that. It seemed a, a good idea until we got to about page 60 of the risk assessment. It's by far the biggest risk assessment I've done. Um, and, uh, and we put it together because, because we needed the input to make sure you know, who's, who's doing what, what and all, how we're going to want to do it. So I think to circumvent a bit, to, to just explain what I mean by that, the actors put forward that, uh, that we need to have guidelines in place. 
uh, and specifically it talks about, con the, the, the government spoke about consultation within the industry. Um, they want some sort of consensus so that we can build a guideline. The guideline is not the beginning and end uh, of, of this risk management process. It's up to, to the different productions to take that guideline as the base uh, and to develop their protocols on top of it. We, we're using the term meet and exceed. So meet the, the guidelines and then exceed them where you need to. Um, and and it's, it's the, the biggest thing is it's going to be this living uh, project, this living document. Uh, the, the analogy earlier, we're talking about camera, and you talk about an operator and a focus puller next to each other, for instance. Um, that's going to be that's going to be entertaining for bystanders for a while because we've got to trial shields at the first place. We need to try and work out how we separate them. Secondly, you know, we, we're going to end up with a bit, of, uh, a bit of bumping as we go along, and so protocols are going to need to be re revisited all the time. So once the protocols are in place and you've got everything going, the compliance officer's role is to ensure compliance with the various acts as well as with the guidelines adopted. So oversee the screening process in the morning, which you know involves the temperature checking as well as the um, descriptive questions and there are a number of questions that, that get asked as we go through. Uh, but then also making sure that, that the balance of it is adhered to. There are across the, the various acts from um, DAC, from the uh, communications guys, from the Disaster Management Act itself, but also in the labor, the, the release from the Department of Labor, the the are a number of, of small little things that have to be adhered to. They're not it's not guidance, it's an instruction. So things like hand sanitizer has to be available. Compliance officer's job is to make sure hand sanitizer is available. They talk about the, the employer's duty to, to inform, to make sure that everyone working uh, on, on, a, on a production understands inherent risk, but also understands the, the, the greater context. So do they have a basic understanding of what's happening in terms of the, the COVID thing? Do they have an understanding of what the industry is doing about it? Are they aware of the contents of these documents? And so the compliance of needs to monitor all of that. Mm. There's strict instruction on cleaning. Cleaning is, is probably the fourth like, the really big one, the risk uh, on the risk. And the compliance officer's job needs to ensure that that cleaning protocol is in place, and that people are following it. Um, and, and because that all summed together is what is going to ensure the safety. Yeah. Let's uh, pick that up with Tinas. Uh, Tinas, part of the the protocol certainly has to be making information available and putting up um, infographics, charts, or just uh, guidelines uh, wherever people can can see these important guidelines. Um, so, in in that respect, um, how will you be managing uh, a production? How would you uh, advise people to? Um, firstly, to manage the role of the compliance officer uh, and also to be putting up important information because your approach is um, how do we do this in a rational, practical way that's effective and that's accessible to everyone? Yeah, I would actually like to jump in on the back of what Ian just said uh, in support of uh, where we're going with this particular topic. Um, I think one of the most important things here is collaboration, sharing of information. We are all going to learn valuable lessons as we move along. And rather than everybody learning those lessons for themselves, if we can share and collate those in a forum like this very one we're busy with at the moment, we will uh, get to move forward a lot quicker. Um, when it comes to the, the idea of uh, visibly putting things out what works best everybody's going to try something you will find what does and what doesn't work what is effective what is ineffective we get to share that with one another the next production can be a better one based on the fact that we realize uh, the following was a waste of time energy effort um, obviously the the most uh, obvious approach is the big visible areas is where one would go with something like that. 
but I think it's beyond just signage uh, and things like that. It is, you know, especially from a crew perspective, you get your call sheet. Uh, on a call sheet, we can have uh, basic protocols laid out for the day for a particular production. Um, in the timing schedules and things like that, when we get to catering, uh, highlight the risks, uh, again, placing things. These are ideas. As we start to explore them and we implement them, we're going to see what does and what doesn't work. Was it effective putting anything on the call sheet? If so, fantastic. Let's continue with that. If it only cluttered the call sheet, let's take it out there and stick it on the front door, <laughs> on the OB's door, on the control room door, as you enter the, the set or the stage um, to get these things going. But I think the key thing here is collaboration, where we all come together from our different sectors. And um, I think it's going to be difficult to co collate and put together a singular set of rules for everybody. But I think sure. to some extent, one would want to have some sort of uh, uh, all-encompassing umbrella type helicopter view of things, which is um, the, the European Film Union has done a, a film commission, did an interesting thing that they talk about the Ten Commandments. Something simple that puts uh, yeah. it together on a bigger picture. And then as you go down to the specifics, you drill down for each division. So if you get to cameramen, if you get to soundmen, if you get to actors, if you get to the production crew, uh, uh, that everybody has sort of a slightly more detailed layout of what is required or asked of them. Because as an actor, you don't want to read through everybody else's shenanigans and try and get like, I just want to know what is important to me. What is it that I need to fulfill to make everybody else safe? So that's where the uh, sort of breakdown will happen. But that bigger that, overview yeah. is still very, very important. That is so, that so point, true. In, I, if, I, I'd like to actually ask Roberta about that. There's um, a provision being made for an induction that basically speaks to yes. um, what, what Tinas refers to. And I think that's, that's so important, not only for the purposes of sharing information that applies to everyone, but it also helps to get people thinking about what is it that the other department needs from me and not just focused on my own needs? Um, could you talk us through the, the process of the induction, uh, Roberta? What would you want to achieve from there? How would you use that as a mechanism? Well, I think the induction is hugely important. I mean, what we, you know, you first send out the protocols that you have devised and how you know your particular set is going to work prior to the time. And then um, we certainly have had an induction um, process uh, with the medic, um, and we've done it in, you know, we're doing it in groups um, with the compliance officer, um, you know, going carefully through the protocols, um, and also, you know, at the space where we're working, so people understand, you know, this is where your area is, this is how it's going to work. Um, so that people, before you start shooting, are very clear as to, you know, what is expected of them. So I think the induction is uh, extremely important uh, and should be done, you know, with, with, the, produ with the line producer, uh, the compliance officer, and the medic, um, and, and, you know, really going through the, the detail of the protocols, the detail of the rhythm. Um, and, and procedure. Yeah, I think that's the the communication element that that is going to have to be a, a central pillar of our entire protocol. Uh, Melina, you're still with us, right? Yes, I'm here. Talk to us about uh, compliance uh, generally, because I think one of our big concerns is um, you, you're talking about an industry here that is generally not regulated by statute. We are basically doing this because we have industry agreements with each other. We have uh, best practice that, that guides our working days. Um, We're and largely self-regulated. Pretty much, pretty much exactly what, what we are. So given that we are mostly self-regulated, uh, the question of compliance is always going to come up. Um, what is your approach to compliance? Try to get people to understand how important compliance is and is there a way to get people back into line if they're pushing the envelope too far? Um, I think part of the reason of writing these protocols was in order to set out the rules for everybody. 
Um, I know that we have um, SASFED and us have slightly different ones, but we have shared information between us because our requirements are different. Um, the point is that for all intents and purposes, the protocols become the minimum compliance document and everyone has to toe that line. It is a condition on which you actually work. It is will be issued before um, any job that everyone knows what they have to do. I think the biggest risk we have generally is that we have a bit of a gung-ho vibe um, generally among crews. So we would avoid people who are not willing to comply with the rules. It is stage four lockdown and I think that we are very privileged to have managed to get ourselves open so early in this process because at one stage it was looking like filming and certainly for us in, co in the commercial sector we were only going back either at stage two or stage one. Um, so I think we as we are all as strong as our weakest link. So ultimately, everyone will have to toe the line. There will be a medic. Def we've always had as commercial on commercial sets. We've always had a medic, at minimum. If it's a smaller set and the medic can be the compliance officer, there will be um, the medic will play that role. Otherwise, we will have a separate compliance officer. As production, we will also be in charge and be very familiar with the protocols and what it is that we um, we are following. And similarly, we have also put the onus on, or we've encouraged individual crew members, if they feel unsafe or insecure in any way, that they must report it, because ultimately we're all as good as our weakest link. Yeah, I think that, that describes it perfectly. Anna, when you're talking to your actors, um, typically, and you know, you might know this from experience as well, the part of the structure of um, a studio environment, for example, will include the green room. Um, the green room is a sacred space. It's a sharing space. Um, it's where um, people get to get get to share. Them, they get to rehearse. Um, they get to gossip. Um, they they have a lot of fun, but the, um, the the effect of that cannot be understated. If you have to look for the the spirit of a production, chances are you'll find it in that green room. Certainly, as it as it applies to the cost, it's something that we can't afford to have, given um, our need to observe social distancing. Um, do you think that's something that we are going to address? Does the protocol address that? Uh, how are we going to keep people apart? Because if it happens, if people all end up in the green room together, uh, we are defeating the object of the exercise. What are we going to do about that? Absolutely. Um, I think, Jack, in terms of um, how everyone has described that the main idea is to minimize the amount of people on a set at a time. Um, of course, in terms of actors having their own personal space to get to to get dressed, to sort of calm calm their nerves before they get onto to set, to you know relax in their own space, those will need to be provided per production. So production has to ensure that every actor has their own space, that they're not sharing spaces like a common room, and that if there are common spaces like I mean like a green room, and if there are common spaces that it is outside or with, within a well-ventilated space where, where actors are able to observe social distancing. So I do think that it is going to be difficult because an actor, you know, um, you as actors are used to the, the touching and being close to one another and, and really sharing intimate moments within even those green, great green rooms and on set. But I do believe that if each production, each, each actor um, tries to maintain and tries to, to observe that they are following the guidelines and the protocols that this can be avoided for as long as we need it to be avoided absolutely we that's what we need to do Daphne I think um we've just got a few minutes left but I think it's important to hear from you about um the, the way crew works as well um they have teams of their own in the same way that you know actors might want to get together because they're shooting a scene they're going to be running their lines they're going to be very very close uh, crews have exactly that that kind of spirit in a in a different um operational sense but 
we've got to try and make sure also that not they are not just keeping each other safe, but um, reporting relies very much on crew as well. And um, one of those things that helps the process is that crew work of um, a chain of command. Um, production works of a chain of command, but I think it, it really, really applies most often with crew. Um, how are we going to be getting them to, to, to see that this is, a lot of this relies on them. Reporting is going to be a huge issue. Um, are, we, are we reminding crew that this is a lot rests on their shoulders as well? I, th I think definitely. I mean, we just with regards to the crew that I represent, we've been having Monday night um, Zoom meetings, if you want to call it, just discussing what the way forward. Uh, luckily, we represent a lot of the camera crew and the DOPs. They're all very aware of of what's at stake, and you know they want to they want to continue working. So I don't think anyone's really going to put themselves in jeopardy to to have the industry you know, go back to level five where no one can work. We've been speaking about comm units, about, you know, keeping everyone in communication with maybe not necessarily radios, but looking at um, options like a unity thing through your cell phones, you know, so that it's a personalized um, communication device. You, you buy software and you can talk with your major teams through your own headset and your own phone. So I think those kind of um, technology-based solutions are going to be quite a big help for, you know, the DOP to speak to his camera team as well as his gaffers and his sparks and stuff without there having to be, you know, too many breaking in, in those kind of protocols. Um, I know that there's been lots of discussions about keeping clients and agency um, out offset, um, looking at remote systems to, to you know, sort of keep them in their office or their own environment rather than bringing them onto set. So I think as, you know, as shooting crew, there's been quite a bit of of, of out-the-box thinking there. But I think we're, we're all in the same situation. No one wants to go back to level five and no one wants to stop working. So um, the... And we do have that, you know, sort of hierarchical sense that you work for this DOP, you're his focus puller, you're his loader. So there is a sense of that command already happening. So I don't, I don't see it getting like too crazy out of hand with like rogue units, you know, coming and giving each other hugs and stuff. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> yeah, but I do, you know, I think, I think, I think there's been a shoot that's already happened, and I think, you know, we'll just get used to. Put taps instead of instead of high fives and stuff. But I, we're we're all wanting to work, which is I think a great place to be. Yeah, um, I, I think that also captures the spirit so much. I think going forward, most productions are going to be relying on the the, um, the chain of command, the, the reporting structures that are established by the technical crew. Um, I don't think there 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 are better teams to rely on than that. As Tina's pointed out earlier, we are definitely going to be looking at our protocols um, to see what works and what doesn't. And if something doesn't, then we must be able to share that with each other. Hopefully, we're going to have another engagement like this. We're going to ask Kevin Jones to um, to assist his an expert administrator. Um, I'd like to thank you all and um, uh, for participating. We've shared a lot. There there will be much more to come out of this. And uh, just a reminder that. Um, uh, there will be uh, an illicit trade in hugs, but um, we, must all, we must all engage wherever we can. We need each other now more than ever before. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks for having Thank us. You, Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.